Good morning. Uh, my name is John Archer. I'm with SA Exploration. And I'll be talking about high density receiver deployment using drones or unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs. I'd like to recognize at this point my co authors, Frank Adler of Total and Mike Powell from RPS. I'll introduce METIS for those who haven't heard of it and then briefly touch upon one of the less well known benefits of receiver carpets before moving on to some of the key innovations that have finally put these within reach for land crews at least. I'll also provide an update on where we are in the project and show a concept in which we can see Seismic 4.0 at its full potential. METIS is a project that was launched by Total in 2016 and aims to use technological advances to reduce the cost and headcount of seismic acquisition in harsh environments, spanning the range from flat deserts to mountainous forests and obviously different solutions are required for each. In many respects it can be considered as the industry 4.0 of seismic where the main pillars are interconnecting people's sensors and devices, massive real-time data integration, in our case the seismic data can be fully retrieved in real time, using AI and robotics to help wherever possible and finally decentralized decision making such as path planning and the use of autonomous vehicles. I'll talk a little bit about receiver carpets uh, and in particular I want to discuss their benefits with regards to near surface scatterers as this is becoming a hot topic in the industry. With the trend towards ever greater trace densities and the corresponding increase in the number of receivers being used, the question then becomes where best to place them. We almost always add them to the existing receiver lines by tightening up the group interval and we do this for economic reasons as the incremental cost in deploying the additional receivers along the same line is minimal compared to having to open and walk a completely new line. And when the interval, the inline interval, is equal to the crossline interval, then we have a carpet layout. And ideally, we would have this sufficiently dense to allow us to sample the noise unaliased as well as the signal. However, this typically requires another order of magnitude increase in the receiver density and has made receiver carpets on land uneconomic until now. Fortunately, the cross-spread technique has allowed us to effectively process data that is acquired in a more typical orthogonal layout. However, there's one less well-known aspect where it has problems, and that is with near-surface scatterers. The travel times of surface scatterers are circular cones, as shown in a very nice paper by Meunier 1999, and are easily removed with standard noise filtering tools like 3D velocity filters in the carpet 3D geometry. Uh, and if we look at that, here's a model that's been done. You can see we've got the shot here in, in red, and then we've got receivers, sorry, scatter points in blue. And this is a time slice, so you can see that the actual shot, we're looking at the ground roll here, which is a thousand meters per second, so that's in a nice circle around the center. This other scatter point here has got this nicely formed spreading event here and then you've got the others a bit further away so they haven't had a chance yet to spread out as much. This is at two seconds, then this is the same thing a second later <clears throat> at three seconds. So um, that's quite easy for us to attenuate with a standard velocity filter. Um, but let's look at it in the cross spread and we can see that instead of having these nice cones we have rounded pyramids with flattened curves and apexes. The flat part of the noise can't be readily determined from signal, which complicates its removal. So what do we need to do to enable the efficient deployment of these dense receiver carpets? So why do we decide to deploy from the air? Well, the main reason is that it's faster, significantly faster. So this is a picture of one of our new UAVs uh, that is custom designed to drop the darts, the sensors. Uh, this can move at 15 meters per second over the terrain, irrespective of slope or ground cover. So that's 10 times faster than a person can walk. Secondly, it's consistently faster. So the UAV doesn't care if there's a ravine or a fence or a cliff in between one station and the next. It's still 50 meters in the air or 25 meters in the air, whatever the spacing is, uh, and it does it in the same amount of time. Whereas when we deal with people and with vehicles, then we can get a lot of changes in the productivity depending upon the terrain type. And because productivity is so good and so consistent, we can deploy a lot of receivers with far fewer resources. 
In fact, we estimate that we can deploy 2,500 sensors per person per day. So in other words, a crew of eight could deploy 20,000 sensors. And that would be for a 20 by 20 receiver carpet. And of course, all of this leads to a safer operation. With fewer vehicles in the field and fewer people, then our exposure is considerably reduced. In fact, of the eight people who are deploying the 20,000 sensors, they don't even get out of the vehicle. They're there really for oversight of the UAV operation. In addition to developing a custom fleet of UAVs that you can see there on the right hand side, our partners Altran Scallion have also had to develop some flight control software that ensures that the fleet can work together in a swarming mode safely and efficiently. This also enables us to simulate missions. Uh, in the example that's showing at the moment, you can see the dropper UAVs uh, going to their locations, the drop points they've selected, which are white, and then once they've dropped them, they, the sensors report back through the wireless system to, to return their status and show that they've successfully connected to the network. We've geofenced off some areas in red, which are infrastructure such as roads and pipelines, and you can see the green lines that cross those are corridors where the UAVs are allowed to cross. Another key innovation is a safety clearance system. Clearly with swarming UAVs and uh, particular UAVs that are dropping things from a height, it's essential that we make sure that the mission areas are completely clear of any kind of people or vehicles or animals that might um, be at risk. So there's a number of things, that, steps that we have to take. The first thing is that we map and we geofence all of the infrastructure that's on the, on the ground. So that's um, power lines, pipelines, buildings, and roads. Uh, we also make sure that all of the people on the crew have tracking beacons, so we know exactly where they are at any time. And each of those beacons will be avoided by UAV, so the UAV will not be able to overfly anybody with a beacon. We also position ground sensors at, at likely access points around the particular mission area that we're operating operating in at a, uh, at a time. Um, and then we have people stationed to detect for intruders, uh, and then intruders are tracked and geofenced. So an intruder in this case could just be um, an animal, a, a cow or a horse or something like that. Uh, or it could actually be someone driving by in a vehicle. Once intruders are detected, then the system automatically creates what we call a dynamic geofence. That's a geofence, a bubble that follows the intruder and prevents again any overflight of UAVs um, to avoid risk of accidental uh, drop of a sensor. Uh, the UAVs have forward-looking infrared and high-res cameras that um, is checked and, and verified prior to any drops to make sure there's nothing underneath. And then we, on top of that, we also have a surveillance UAV that is doing patrols of the area while a mission is ongoing. Another key innovation has been in the area of sensor retrieval. So we've got two kinds of sensor. One is a retrievable one that we reuse, and another one is a disposable sensor, which we're developing at the moment. And the idea is that in open areas where we do have access, then we can use the retrievable sensors and then recharge them and redeploy them. But in those areas where access is extremely expensive, for instance, uh, mountainous rainforest, then we do have a disposable dart, we call it the eco dart, which we're able to deploy and then leave in place. The eco dart is printable, minimal electronics. The plastic is biodegradable. And we're actually using a, an eco battery, which is made of paper. There are a number of different options for recovering the rechargeable sensors. Uh, it, it can be done manually, of course, uh, or in the case I've shown here, this is the UGV, the unmanned ground vehicle, which will go to known locations, scoop up the darts, and place them into their charging racks in the back of the unit. Now for a quick overview of where we are in the timeline for METIS. The first test drops were performed in Houston in 2016. Then at the end of 2017, we completed a small pilot in the jungle of PNG to verify some of the aspects related to the wireless recording system and wireless propagation in the rainforest. 
Earlier this year, we did an initial test in Abu Dhabi to look at adapting the DART to the desert environment. And we plan to follow that up next year with a larger pilot using the full fleet of UAVs for the first time and incorporating the command and control and the full safety clearance system. And then finally, the goal is to have a full industrial pilot in 2024, which will probably be either in the desert uh, or in PNG. And with that one, we hope to have in the region of 50,000 sensors deployed and anywhere from 5 to 25 UAVs. So here are some pictures from the pilot that we did in PNG. Uh, some of the goals of this pilot were to automatically fly the UAV above the canopy. Takeoff and landing were manual, but the actual flight itself was routed via uh, waypoints at predefined sky holes. We also wanted to assess the penetration of the darts and the coupling. Uh, evaluate the communication system in the rainforest because there are challenges in wireless communication and uh, verify the quality of the seismic signal. So in the end we dropped a total of 62 darts from approximately 50 meters height and we were using the first prototype UAV which had a capacity of four darts. Of the 62, eight had bad landings and a little over 50% communicated successfully back to the central server. Here's a short clip from the first phase of the Abu Dhabi pilot that we performed earlier on this year. The main goal of this really was to look at what we needed to do to adapt the darts and to a certain extent the UAVs um, from the rainforest to the desert domain. Uh, of course, the main issue was we were concerned about how the darts would couple in the sand and what would be the optimal drop height and the nose cone type to be able to use for that. And we used the 2017 PNG UAV for this test and also the PNG darts. One outcome from this test is that we've had to redesign the aerodynamics of the dart body to be more stable in the windy conditions. We did a data comparison of the sensors that were dropped from the UAVs on the left hand side versus the same sensor in a different form factor with the same electronics uh, which were actually buried in the sand on the right just to make sure the coupling was okay and it, um, it looks fine. Another first was dropping at night to de-risk the infrared camera and uh, here you can see the UAV taking off. In this case, it's got three darts on board. And then we switch to forward looking infrared mode. And you can see the sand dunes, the base of the sand dunes there. And then there's a little track running along there. And it gets to the location it's looking for, which is pre programmed, drops the dart. And you can see a little white puff there where the hotter sand just underneath the surface comes up upon impact. And again, in this case, the UAV was manual. However, in the next phase of the pilot, the UAVs will be fully automated from takeoff through landing. Finally, I'd like to go through um, some upcoming innovations. This is a concept that we have for a mobile GCS, a ground control station. This is intended for a high productivity desert crew and incorporates not only a fully automated UAV deployment and recovery system, but also the uh, UGVs that we showed earlier. So in the central box, we have the surveillance UAV. In this particular case, it's actually tethered, so it can remain in the air for as long as it likes as it gets its power from the truck. And it's doing intruder detection and tracking. Meanwhile, the dropper UAVs take off from the front and fly out to the spread. Um, and we imagine up to four of these in a truck, four UAVs, dropper UAVs in a truck at once, plus a surveillance UAV. And they can each go out to about a kilometer of range away from the, the truck. 
and then once they've dropped their full set of darts then they return back and land on the on the rear platform and all of these technologies are already existing actually in the market today and then once they come in then the the dark cartridge is replaced with a new one and the batteries the UAV batteries are swapped out for fresh ones and it moves forward and then continues on its cycle for the next run meanwhile the UGVs are doing the run from the back of the spread up to the front bringing the darts they've collected and these darts get loaded onto the conveyor belts and then charged on charging racks within the GCS and this operation would typically run throughout the night and then in the morning once the the, um, the mission area has been completed then the UAVs come back the truck picks off and then moves forward another two kilometers to the next location. So to summarize, <clears throat> recording the full wave field using carpet receiver layouts provides benefits that aren't achieved with cross-spread techniques. Ideally, we'd acquire sufficiently dense carpets to avoid aliasing both signal and noise, but standard manual deployment of this number of receivers is usually economically unfeasible. However, by applying the principles of Industry 4.0 to Seismic, in particular by using autonomous vehicles for receiver deployment and retrieval, we can theoretically achieve sufficient productivity to enable the much talked of million channel crew, and more importantly, do it with a fraction of the personnel and at a significantly lower cost. The building blocks for such a system have been created and proven viable and will be further tested and implemented over the next few years. I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues, uh, the Total Metis team in France, uh, our other Metis partners, RPS, VTT, and Altranscalian, and finally my group in R&D and the operations teams in SA Exploration. Thank you.